Hey everyone, my name is Ryan Griggs and I'm the host of the Regenesance Podcast. And today alongside me, I have Charles Mayfield at Pharaoh Skin Care. Thank you for joining me. Ryan, it's awesome to be here, man. So I guess to get started, before we uh, set this live, we were talking a little bit. So you grew up on a farm, but it wasn't necessarily what you would think in terms of growing up and having to do all the the, the labor yourself and, and chores as a kid. Um, I guess if you can just talk a little bit about that experience, because it's kind of unique in the sense of it's you're still out in nature, but you're not working on a, a farm per se. Sure. Yeah, sure. So uh, the the property that I grew up on, we were talking before we hit record, it, I, I think it's like the Garden of Eden. Like it, I look back on it, it was we had a natural spring coming out of the out of the ground in our backyard that fed a creek that uh, fed a pond. So we had crawdads and snakes, natural cool water, you know, geese. Uh, it was on 17 acres. This was the property, I, if I understand historically right. So my, my mom and dad met in Atlanta. Dad was at uh, Georgia Tech and my mom was at a what I think they called a finishing school, a women's school in, uh, Atl- in Atlanta. And uh, I think this was a property that my grandfather ended up buying for them to sort of coax them back home. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, I, I think my mom was pregnant with me. And they moved, I don't, don't remember the timing, but it was a b- great place. It was not a farm. It was, but it was 17 acres. And, uh, we had, you know, I, I again, I, I remember us having some chickens. I remember us having some goats. Like, Lord, we had peacocks at one point. Um, and, uh, you know, electric fencing and our, our chicken coop was what you would imagine. Most people's chicken, you know, it was like a stationary coop. And so it was, you know, for, for nine for, for 12 months out of the year, it was like a moonscape, you know, cause they just ate everything down. But, um, but yeah, I grew up outside a lot, catching, catching frogs and crawdads and snakes and, you know, outdoors and, and, and occasionally the chores, uh, for, for our hobbyist sort of farm. My mom had ran a, about a quarter acre garden for our home and she canned beans and tomatoes. And, uh, so, you know, and for those that don't know, a quarter acre garden is a lot of garden, uh, for your home. But I had, you know, I was the oldest of three kids. Um, you know, we'd have, have a dog and some farm animals and, uh, and other than that, sort of a regular old small town, uh, East Tennessee life. Did you think through all that, um, that it would lead you to, to farming or I'm just curious from that upbringing. Cause for me personally, I grew up in I guess the middle America suburby type feeling. And there's some surrounding rural parts that had farms, but I was so disconnected and yeah, never had really experienced what you experienced growing up. So that never really came to me, even though I always loved animals because growing up, I wanted to be a veterinarian. But since I had never really been out in nature, that was just something that never came to me. Yeah. I mean, Ryan, I, I've come to farming late. I, I don't. I don't consider what I was doing as a child farming. Um, I guess. I guess you, a lot of people could call it that. But my my view of farming now is more as a, as an endeavor, as a not a hobby or a just something to do. Although you know, my mom took that gardening thing very seriously. Like we we literally ate those green beans all winter long. Like she canned for the winter. It was awesome. Uh, <laughs> but I. Uh, I did grow up in the outdoors. Uh, you know, my dad was a duck hunter. I would go deer hunting. My mom's family was from South Alabama. So we, we, you know, I grew up deer hunting and duck hunting and dove hunting. And, and so I think that's probably the primary connection to the outdoors that, that kept farming a possibility for me, but it was, it, it never even crossed my mind. Um, you know, I went to college in Atlanta, I went to Georgia tech. I, you know, like the idea, <laughs> I would say if you'd asked me, literally, if you'd asked me, am I going to be a farmer up until about, up until about 2012, 13, if you'd have asked me, I'd have told you you were crazy, but that's, that's about the time I started, you know, my, my ex-wife and I have written a number of, of cookbooks in the paleo space. And it was really the paleo nutrition sort of CrossFit paleo scene that cast my, uh, cast my eyes onto regenerative agriculture. And so, um, there was a conference in, in Austin, Texas called paleo FX. And it launched, I think in 2012 and was a great conference for years. I don't think they're doing it anymore, but, um, 
But it was at that conference, you know, the first couple of years, it was everybody arguing over protein, carbs, and fat. And then all of a sudden, everyone sort of put their weapons down. And it was like, we need to start talking about food sustainability, access to food, regenerative ag. And so, you know, the the Diana Rogers, the Epic uh, Epic Bars, the White Oak Pastures, the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, these are all the vendors that you started to see sort of descend uh, upon Austin, Texas once a year. And that's, that's how I, if you want to talk about how I got my got regenerative ag got its hooks in me uh we were uh, julie and i were invited to polyface farms i'm gonna say this was in the fall of 2012 i think that's right no 2000 maybe 13 or 14 anyway we were they the farm to consumer legal defense fund had just gotten started and they were doing this big fundraiser and Sally Fallon Morell was there with Weston A. Price Rob Wolf was there with sort of the paleo community some big big names and it, but it was at Polyface Farms. And so, you know, I'd read about Polyface through uh, Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma. You know, Joel had put out, uh, is a prolific writer, but it was it was that first trip. And uh, I call it Mecca. I, <laughs> Polyface is Mecca to me. If you have not been, um, you know, we were talking before, I'm, I'm happy to make an intro to, to Joel for you. Uh, but Ryan, you, you, you definitely need to go. And yeah, so, no, I've never been, but I would love to. Oh yeah, dude, we got we got to make that happen, and they've got a pretty open door policy there, so you you can just hop in the car and go anytime you want. But I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to make it a, an intro to to Joel and the Salton family. Um, but that was that was what got that got my attention was just walking on that property and understanding what they've been able to do. And so, fast forward, you know, a handful of years, and moved out of Atlanta back up to Tennessee to to, to give it a go. So before you went to Folly Face Farms, were you eating just mainly from grocery stores or were you going to your own farms and, and ranches locally? A little bit of both. Uh, you know, again, I've, I've been an avid hunter uh, all my life. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not spending weeks upon weeks. I'm a sort of a convenience hunter. It's not, not, doesn't engulf me too much, but you know, I usually have a, at least one deer in the freezer every year. And I would say... We started sourcing. We started sourcing some of our beef locally uh, in and around Atlanta, uh, and we, you know you shop at the farmers markets. You shop. You know you, the, the Atlanta's got some unbelievably high quality farmers markets, and then in addition to that, they've got some <laughs> very robust brick and mortar markets. You know the Decatur Farmers Market is what it's called. I mean, it's probably a twenty thousand square foot facility that. You know, internationally, it runs a lot of food. You know, obviously through Atlanta, and so you're able to shop in a in a store in Atlanta and still be shopping pretty pretty elaborately local. Because hmm. that's what made me think. Whenever I was traveling a lot last year, I visited a ranch in Colorado, and I remember as I was staying there and just having the fresh beef from their cow, and they also had a garden such as yours growing up, and just that first bite I had it was literally life changing because i had never i never really went to farmers markets i definitely had not visited a ranch or farm and so everything i was eating was from a grocery store and there's obviously still good quality stuff but overall it's nothing compared to actually from a, a local ranch and farm and yeah my mouth waters every time i think about that dish cuz it was just so good so you moved to yeah. Tennessee oh go ahead yep well now i was just going to say it's just it's like hunting like it never tastes better than when you you know, when you, when you harvested it yourself, I, farming was that way for me as well. Like I, I still have a hard, I mean, I love other people's bacon, uh, but, but I have a hard time liking it more than the bacon I grew for many years. So, uh, it's tough. <laughs> but you start, so you moved to Tennessee. Did you start growing hemp to start? We got, uh, no, I started with animals. Okay. Uh, this would have been, uh, my first test batch of test batch of broilers and layers and I got a small batch of pigs. This would have been the fall of 2016 and, you know, a test batch. So figuring out if I'm going to kill everything or not and, and everything worked out okay. And so we launched Mayfield Pastures was the name of it. I, you know, we had moved from Atlanta. I had a number of friends and was running a gym in Atlanta. And so we, we've got a number of people already interested in local food. And so, 
we did what was called, sort of called a buying club. And so everyone sort of threw in sort of like a CSA, you know, threw mm-hmm. in 500, a thousand bucks. And, uh, I grew pork, beef, beef took a little while, but pork, chicken, eggs, a uh, batch of turkeys every year. And, and it took us about a year and a half to get the beef up and ready. But yeah, it, um, you know, they would just work off their balances, order whatever they wanted to. And we do a monthly drop to, uh, to Atlanta and one to Chattanooga. And then we had some local customers pick up. But that launched in about 2017, got a little bit more serious in 2018. Hemp did not come along until 2019. Uh, got, uh, you know, there was a lot of change to the federal laws. Uh, starting in 2019. And so, um, yes, uh, not, not my farm per se, but myself and some others, we, you know, started a hemp company. Um, yep. And that was, that was, yeah, the hemp, the hemp business was a lot of, a lot of interesting lessons from that. I, I'm still a, a, a very big fan of that plant. I think it's, uh, I think it, you know, back to the Regenaissance, uh, motif. I think uh, the history of, of hemp as a plant and as a textile and a number of other things, I would love to see a, a re-emergence of its uh, proclivity uh, in our world. And uh, yeah, we, we lost our ass doing it. But uh, but silver linings, I got the sunburn that ultimately led to the launch of Faro uh, that <laughs> summer of 2019. So yeah, can't can't <laughs> I can't be mad at the whole thing. So what I'm curious, what made you add hemp then? If you were already doing broilers and and you're on your way with cattle, and then you had pigs. Well, gosh, uh, what made us? Well, uh, there were a bunch of people interested. It was not just me. It, we, we had a team of people that we. It was a lot of people willing to throw money at it, and uh, there was a lot of money in it. And so, um, I, you know, one of the interesting things for me personally, and interest in hemp was I wanted to. I wanted to test how well hemp, uh, and when I say hemp growing, I'm really talking about, you know, the CB, the oils, uh, you've got the textile side of the house. We, we did, that was not what we were doing, but I wanted to see how well this plant could fit into a regenerative paradigm, right? Now we scaled, I mean, our hemp business was unbelievably industrial sized, uh, several hundred acres, you know, this was tilled land, you know, uh, it, it was, it was a monocrop approach, but it also allowed me to test Ryan. Um, one of the, one of the biggest issues you have with hemp for your listeners that don't know are weeds, uh, growing, you know, huh, that's sort of a punny, <laughs> punny kind of thing there. But, you know, if you think about how you plant corn or anything else, you know, and, and they've got all these chemicals out there to come in and, and kill all the weeds with, um, with soybeans or, you know, they got Roundup ready this, not with, not with hemp. So cultivation was one of our biggest concerns. And, and so here I've got this little 60 hen laying operation, portable hen house. And so I'm doing like field tests with, with hemp. So I'd roll them into a specific area, rope it off. And, you know, cause the, the, the morning glory and all these little weeds that would that would overtake your hemp. Uh, they're popping up through the ground, and these little chickens come along and just destroy. It. They left the hemp alone, and um, and and cultivated it unbelievably. So I, I'm getting a far afield here. That was one of my big motivations was seeing seeing how it might fit, and I and I do still think it could fit into a regenerative model uh, in a number of different ways. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm a, a couple questions with that. Um, compared to the amount of water needed for your animals, how much was needed for hemp? Oh God. It's a lot more, um, right? It's a ton. I mean, I, I, listen, I don't have an industrial crop background at all. Yeah. I don't, I don't really have a crop background. Uh, so I don't have anything to compare to. I wouldn't compare water usage of plants to animals. I think that's, you know, um, for a number of reasons, and you already know this, most of the water, a, a, a cow or a pig or a chicken consumes is rainfall. And so, um, you know, when you start to do like gallons of comparison, I I think you get into a lot of trouble there. Uh, It was a very thirsty plant. I will say that. And, uh, you know, if I'm being 
completely honest, you know, I, I it didn't make it didn't make my regenerative heart feel real good the way we were planting most of this hemp, right? I mean, we were tilling; it was high tillage. High. I mean, we weren't spraying any chemicals. That wasn't because we didn't want to. That was because there are no chemicals approved to spray with hemp, right? And so, uh, it was a very industrial model, but but it allowed me to dip my toes into hemp and look at it with a, with a regenerative lens. And like I said, I, I, I'm convinced you could drop it into a, a regenerative model. Um, with overseeding, I think you could take off some of the water requirements, maybe, just by planting it into, um, well, it's like you overseed for the winter. You know, I don't know how much you understand these no-till cedars and stuff like that, but, you know, you can graze a patch of land in June, July, August, graze it down hard, you know, get it four, five, six inches tall, and then come in with a cedar, a no-till cedar. And you can put, I mean, people do this all the time and they'll seed a, a winter rye or a, they'll, a, an annual crop as, as a uh, food stuff, you know, as something that's going to come in when the temperature's cool and allow you to graze. So now you're grazing, you know, seasonally all year long. You could do that with hemp. You could drop it in, uh, and I don't know that the cows would graze it or the sheep or, you know, goats might touch it. I, I haven't seen any far- domesticated animals eat it yet. Uh, that's not to say they wouldn't, but, um, you know, anything will eat almost anything if it's too hungry. But if you, if you, if the rest of the forage looks pretty good, I think they'd probably leave it alone. And so then you're in a situation where you could stack a hemp operation on top of a, um, you know, a, a regenerative grazing model. The, the other thing I learned, you know, again, with hemp, I would have never known this. We, we cloned all of our plants, right? So every plant we put in the ground was a clone. And um, the reason you do it that way is because you want all females, right? Because you want the females have more oil, blah, 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 blah. You know, the world's full of honoring females. You know, hen, hens get a lot more attention than roosters, right? It's same as in the hemp space. And so we cloned them. Well, what, what one thing you learn when you clone a plant versus planting directly from seed is a, a, a seeded plant's going to have a taproot. That taproot's job is to get deep and find water when there is no water. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons I believe that industrial hemp is so thirsty is most of it's not done with, with seeds. It's done with clones. So you had that going on to, in terms of just regenerative practicing with the animals, what was that like leading up to your sunburn and then the, I guess the catalyst towards Tfero. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, animal agriculture is amazing. Uh, the, I mean, it's what I, what I tell people, this is probably not the best statement, but I think it's, I think it's fairly close, um, is, you know, proper animal husbandry, whether you want to call it holistic land management or, you know, mig graze, you know, there's, there's, there's a million terms, but I, I would call it a, a, a polyface, model, a savory institute model, a white oak model. Um, it's not a lot of work every day. It's work every single day, uh, as it relates to your animals, right? Um, doesn't matter the, the breed or the type that they need to see you every day. They need to be moving every day. Uh, you know, pigs, you can, you, you can move a pig maybe once a week, you know, you can leave chickens in the spot for maybe a day or two. Uh, you could, you can stretch those out, but it, Every day requires them seeing you, you seeing them, because it's a it's an active process. It's a it's it's on the go all the time, and so um, so yeah, it's 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 hard to get away from uh, for sure. It's a lifestyle, uh, you know that, but it's it's such a great lifestyle. I mean, I some of my fondest days were days where I would just be on the farm all day. And, um, you know, you get up, get up with the animals, you can go to bed with them. And so it's, it's fun. I mean, you, plenty of hard work, plenty of sweat, lots of tick bites, you know, all, all the things, but, uh, you certainly gain a, a much greater appreciation. It's, I, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, this is not animal related, right? So this is, uh, so uh, my mom, you know, again, she's got this super green thumb gardens every year, but she's got raspberries. Uh, she's had them for a number of years. They got blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, and we never had raspberries growing up, but we, 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 she's got them now. And so when they come into season, 
we'll go, you know, if I've got the kids, we'll just go over to Sassy's house and they'll go pick some raspberries. And I was just at Costco two days ago and they've got raspberries and it looked like, you know, cause it's sort of probably that season or something They they were cheap. You know, it's like, okay, these are obviously, you know, going to be decent cause they're cheap or it's close to seasonal wherever the hell they came from. But I grabbed these two things of raspberries and I'm like, you know, I think everyone should be required to grow raspberries before they get to eat raspberries. Because I'm looking at these two boxes and it was like $2 for a box. I'm looking at them going, dude, that's like $50 worth of raspberries based on like my raspberry experience. Cause you know, you got to pick them by hand and they're so delicate and it's just so, um, but you know, for animal farming's not that, not that different. Like, you know, it's, you got to get out there and get dirty and, and understand the animals, but man, they're so much fun. And kids, I, you know, I, I really did this for my kids in, in, in many, many respects. And that's all the way across for, for whether it was hemp or the animals or Pharaoh, you know, you've always got them in the back of your mind. Like I'm, I want, I want them to have a better life. And so, uh, I'm going to go work my tail off and hopefully create that for them. That's amazing. I heavily relate to, to all of that because I worked on a farm last fall in Pennsylvania and they had raspberries and <laughs> how you're exactly describing it is, is 100% accurate, but then also strawberries. Um, mm. cause they, I mean, they, they didn't spray or anything. And so if it felt like one out of every 10 strawberries we picked, were able to sell and the rest were eaten by a worm or there's all kinds of random things that would happen. And so that's, that's hilarious. But also with the, the animals, I definitely miss, that's the thing I miss the most is waking up and going to release the, the chickens out and just all of that with the sun, sun rising and you're just in the land and all you hear is the nature. It It's such an, an amazing experience and feeling that I think about pretty much every single day I'm in Austin. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It, it's, it's the ultimate biohack, right? Like read all the articles. It's like, you know, go to Huberman's website. It's like get early sun move early in the morning, like, uh, like c- cold plunging. Well, hell cold plunging is just, you know, getting done with your morning chores and hopping in the Creek for, a, you know, <laughs> half a second, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's just, it checks all these boxes like fresh air movement, you know, sunshine, all the things it's, it's quite magical. It's, it's a shame, you know, it's a real, sh- so if, if, um, if we had a big, you know, farmer's market, get together, you know, like if the farmer pulls up, if the farmer pulls up, you know, you have a big party. And if the farmer pulls up in a Mercedes, everyone's looking around going, well, he's charging too much for his food, right? Or he's doing something, you know, he's doing something crooked, but you know, a banker pulls up in a Mercedes or a pharmacist pulls up in a Mercedes or any, you know, anybody else, they don't think twice about it. And it's really, it's, Salatin talks about this all the time. It's really sort of a tragedy. You know, we've, we've, um, discounted farming. Uh, we've aggregated it. You know, the machines have gotten bigger and the, and the combines have gotten more, uh, you know, I mean, we've industrialized, uh, we've mechanized everything, uh, scaled it up and, um, and we've, we've, we've taken humans out of the process. And, and, and this is, I mean, Ryan, this is the, the absolute silver lining that I see. And, and you, I know you see this and you're going to see more and more of it. You know, you can't AI your way out of growing meat properly. You, you, you cannot remove uh, uh, the human uh, empathy, the human understanding, the human, uh, I mean, we're, we're, you know, God, God put us in charge of these animals. And so, um, so I, it gives me hope, like there ain't, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to, you know, it's like, you can't eat a Bitcoin. You can't eat a, you can't eat a promissory note. You can't, you, you can't eat a tractor. You know, you can't, there's yeah. a lot of things you can't, you can't, you cannot replace optimal human interaction for if you're going, if your goal is to produce healthy food that also builds soil, sequesters carbon and, in, and improves the environment, right? You, you cannot remove the human from that formula. You can remove the human from formulas where we don't give a shit about the soil, you know, uh, chemicals be damned. You, you can take humans out of that all day long. Look at the last 60 years. 
you know, and so we're left with, you know, what, 30 to 40 years left of topsoil, you know, and, 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 um, so much genetic, uh, crap, uh, going on. I mean, I think we use more antibiotics on livestock in the U S than we do humans. Right. So we've, we've propped up poor genetics in our, in our domestic animal front. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, but my, my hope is having done it myself, my hope is that, uh, that there will be more and more opportunities for people interested in making a difference and making a living growing healthy food. I think there will be more and more and more opportunities. And I think the econ economics of that will get better and better and better. That's I agree. And also just on the topic of antibiotics, I mean, and pigs, uh, in North Carolina and Iowa, the amount of antibiotics they use just on the pigs there just because the sheer population of the pigs, it's just outrageous. And Smithfield Foods, it's disgusting. Uh, learning about the industrial agriculture, but specifically with pigs, I can't remember the last time I've had pork from a grocery store because of just finding that out. Um, so I guess that could be a good segue leading to the catalyst of you had this sunburn. If you could just talk about that experience and how that led you to using lard for your skincare? Sure. <laughs> so yeah, so it was it was 48 hours of this was at the height of hemp. And so I was up for 48 hours, uh, planting, watering all the things. You know, we had a big team by then, but it was it was go time. And yeah, I came home with a really, really nasty sunburn. You know, I, I was retelling the story the other day, for for all of us, um, uh, Caucasian folks out there, and 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 I know uh, more folks with more melanin in their in their uh, skin don't get as sunburned or do a better job of absorbing um, or fending it off. But anyway, e everyone's got their childhood nasty. You know, I can I can list off about four or five just epically memorable crap sunburns. Right, just absolutely obliterated. This was one of them. I, I I'm not going to put it in the top spot but yeah i came home and and uh small town so you know far stores are closed uh it was it, i so ryan i'd been you know i'd been in this paleo scene i i had a jar of lard in my refrigerator that i was using to cook with you know i'd fry stuff with it i'd uh bake you know whatever and so it was it was equal parts desperation and curiosity because you know I remember my mom having like aloe vera in the refrigerator, you know, when we go on beach trips or whatever, she'd keep it in the fridge just so it was cool. So there was all this stuff sort of going through my head and, you know, I pull this jar out and I mean, you know, I'm lobster red. I, I coated this stuff. You know, it's, I, I was home by myself. This is uh, Julie and I were going through our divorce. She was out of town. It was like empty house, you know, late at night. And I'm barbecued. And so it's just sort of like this pity party in my living room, like in my underwear, <laughs> caking this crap on. And uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, like you're, you're a guy, you can sort of imagine this. Yeah. And, um, and you know, Ryan, it, so I, I'm, I'm caking it on. Right. And all of a sudden, like, I'm just sort of sitting there and it's gone. Like my skin soaked it up, which was amazing. I go take a shower you know, I go to bed, I get up the next morning, I put it on again. You know, I, I'm still, I'm still hot, you know, uh, you know, pretty, pretty baked, but I put it on twice, you know, just that the evening I got home. And then the next morning, of course, went back to the farm doing, doing the things. And, um, about two days later, that was it. I only put on twice. About two days later, my sunburn was pretty much gone, which wow. is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing was I never peeled. And that, if you want to talk about like the straw, you know, the watershed moment, whatever it was over the next couple of weeks, I kept, I watched my skin meticulously because I did remember some real rather horrific sunburns as a kid. And it would be, you know, two weeks later and all of a sudden, like fi finally the, the, the peel came. And so I kept watching and kept watching and I just, I never peeled, not even a little bit. And so you know, I'd never thought about skincare, uh, ever. Uh, and so, yeah, that was when, you know, you go to the Google and you start looking into it. Oh, holy hell. 
Uh, skin cares, you know, it's, it's an emulsification of water and fat. And, you know, so I, you know, I'm just start digging around, playing around with it. And I'm, you know, I, my early, this was, I, I put it on the shelf for a little bit. Cause obviously we were, we were pretty busy. Uh, but later that fall, maybe even early winter of 2020, I, you know, DIY creams. And so I started, I started making creams, just tinkering with it. And, um, yeah, the rest is history. What kind of pigs do you have? We were, uh, I was raising, I, I went through a couple different breeds at the time. Uh, I started off with large blacks. So large black hog is the, is the breed's name. Um, the, those were the, the feeder pigs. So when you're, when you're raising pigs, you can either be a pig farrower. There you go for your listeners. The term farrow is a reference. So farrow as a noun refers to a litter of piglets. It's a hmm. pharaoh of piglets. Pharaoh as a verb is the act of getting mama pig and daddy pig together to make baby pigs. So if you're a pig pharaoher, then you're sort of the farmer overseeing uh, copulation, if you will. So, um, so so when I started off, because see pig pharaohing and pig finishing are two different enterprises, right? Just like with beef, you know, you've been to some farms uh, in, in the beef business, you can be a cow calfer, you can be a yearling place, or you can be a beef finisher. Like to, to, to take a, 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 a born calf all the way through to, you know, a, a steak on your, uh, on your barbecue grill is technically three enterprises from the beef standpoint. And then it, I guess even a fourth enterprise, if you want to count the butcher. But um, in terms of like raising the animals, so pigs can, can be a, you can be a farrower or you can be a finisher, or in this case, I ended up being both. So I started off as just a finisher. And then this was uh, 2016, in 2018, um, someone called me and was like, Hey, I, this farm over the mountains got to move. They, I think they raise pigs like you do. And they've got a, a breeding boar and uh, a breeding sow, and they've got to like they got to get rid of this fast. Are you interested? And so I drove over, and that they had a, a red wattle boar that we ultimately named Brutus, and they had a um, a, a Gloucester Old Spot G O S uh, uh, sow that we ultimately named Ot Olive. So Brutus and Olive, like the Popeye characters. And so we had these beautiful piglets. I mean, like some spotted, some red, some red and spotted. But uh, but yeah, so those are the breeds uh, that I worked with predominantly. And um, so large blacks, uh, old spots and red wattles. Hmm. And, um, and, you know, there's a bunch of great pig breeds. When you get into pigs, you know, um, it sort of depends on what you want, you know, for phenotype. So you got these little pigs like the Cooney Coonies that are more of a grazer. Never done Cooney Coonies. Um, and then, you know, once you get out of Cooney Cooney or any of these sort of Vietnamese, like small pigs, weird pigs, um, your standard breeds, you've got two phenotypes, either a long torpedo or more of a barrel. And if you want, you know, big butts and big hams and lots of sausage, you go with the barrel. If you're more of a bacon belly kind of, kind of person, then you go with the, the longer phenotype. And that gets into sort of how you wanted to scale. Uh, your meat production. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. So on just the topic of skin too, because I mean, we talk about what you put in your body, but it's obviously even just as more important to, to think about what you're putting on your body because skin is the largest organ. And for me, uh, and I know a lot of people just the thought of just putting on uh, pig fat, I've before even hearing about Pharaoh, just a lot of reservations. And so just, on the science of, of lard, what makes it so good for our skin? I am so glad you asked that question, Ryan. So this is a, this is actually a real sign of how, you know, you're, you're, this is the Regenaissance, right? We're talking about bringing back some time honored traditions into agriculture and, 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 and regenerating soil. If, uh, if you closed your eyes and waved your magic wand and rewound the clock 130 years, okay we'd be having a completely different conversation it, it, and you know, you hear tallow now, yeah. Every, most folks are familiar with tallow. Uh, 
Okay. Well, tallow was used to fry McDonald's French fries up until probably what the early nineties. I think they, they McDonald's stopped using tallow. Yeah. But if you, if you understand the history of animal fat, lard was the first animal fat to be, I'm going to, I'm going to call it targeted or picked on by the industrial seed oil world. Okay. So when Procter and Gamble decided to create Crisco, uh, they did that because uh, at the time they were using cottonseed oil to make candles and soap, but candles. And uh, we invent the light bulb and figure out electricity and the candle market don't look so good at the turn of the century. Right. And so it's like, Oh shit. Uh, sorry. I, I, my language. Uh, no, oh, shoot. Uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> We just, you know, we just bought these six cotton mills in Texas and and put all this money into cottonseed oil. What in the world are we going to do with our all this cottonseed oil? And so they figured out how to hydrogenate it and uh, make it somewhat shelf stable. Um, and and then they dyed it white. And then they put on this marketing campaign and wrote cookbooks and. Saturday evening post articles. This was the greatest cooking fat you could ever possibly imagine. And they bleached it white because every person that you talked to in 1904 knew exactly what lard was because they brought an 8, 10, 20, 15, 50 pound tin of this stuff home hmm. from the from the local store. You know, what, what were they called? They were, like the general store. I've got pictures. My my cousin, uh, he and he and his partner, they're they're sort of antiquers, and he's collected lard cans. I've got antique pictures of antique lard cans from the early 1900s, late 1800s. And Ryan, I mean, this is pre refrigeration, you know. This is pre HV. This is pre lots of stuff, right? And you're staring at a. You've seen those popcorn tins, right? Mm -hmm. You're staring at a five gallon bucket of lard. You're staring at a tin that held lard in it. 120, 130 years ago that someone would bring home and, you know, how, I don't know how long it took to go through a, a, a 20 pound or 50 pound a can of lard, but, you know, we fried everything in it. We, hell, we probably put it in our hair. I put it in my hair every day. Um, I'm getting a little far afield, but you're right. Everyone, I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to turn this around because your question is why in the world would I put lard on my face? And you know what? I get that question all the time. Here's my question for you. Have you looked at the ingredients on any facial moisturizer you buy at the store? That That's question number one. And then number two is you're comfortable putting those things on your skin. Because I can tell you right now, there's over 50 ingredients in every product. Uh, half of them you cannot pronounce. And they're either an ethyl alcohol, petroleum derivative, or some type of chemical compound that did not exist a hundred years ago. D d what wasn't even this is part. This is part of the problem with skincare. Okay, um, I I'm going to get a little weird here. Is that all right? Yeah, I'm open. Okay, okay. Um, when a woman gets pregnant, okay, you've ever heard of morning sickness mm -hmm. and, and food aversions during pregnancy? Yeah. Okay. Food aversion during pregnancy uh, was an evolutionary thing because most of the time that food aversion is around meat. Okay. That, that evolved because over time, the most damaging thing, okay, that came along to an infant, a pre preborn fetus was rancid meat, right? That was the, that was the, I mean, obviously you got lions and tigers and bears. Oh my right fight or flight we got handled but but women developed this reflex and this aversion to meat during pregnancy because it was like the one thing that they had control over that could okay right mm -hmm. and that was over years and years and years of evolution okay 99% of the chemicals and stuff in our skincare did not exist 100 years ago okay so our skin you mentioned it's our it's our largest organ. It's called our second stomach, and our skin our skin has developed. It has evolved. Um, if you eat something that does not agree with you, we have a developed mechanism 
for emergency evacuation, evacuation either out of the North Tunnel or the South Tunnel. You're like, like, you need something that doesn't agree with you. You're either vomiting or diarrhea. Like, it's coming out fast. Let's get this thing out of here. Your skin does not have those mechanisms because your skin, if you think about the natural world and the natural environment 200 years ago, 200 years ago, none of these chemicals existed. None of them. And, and, and even if they did, we didn't, they were so expensive, like, you know, skincare up until a hundred years ago was reserved for the elite. It, you know, the ingredients were hard to come by. They were, you know, and, and candidly, most people didn't need them because most people were elbow deep in animal fat every week. Cause you, you know, you kill a deer, you harvest a, a pig, you, you, you get plenty of sunshine, you're hydrated, you're, you know, you, you got less Facebook uh, you know, clicks and I mean, you know, like a uh, hundred and something years ago, most people's skin was pretty righteous. Hell, look at the, look at all the, the there's the, all the memes now of like the 1970s beaches in California. Do yep. you see any fat people? Do you see any sunscreen? You know, it's like, yeah. And that was 1970. Like we looked pretty svelte back then. Like we had good skin, you know, because the, even in 1970, the it's gotten so much work, like and every year it gets even worse in terms of the toxicity in skincare. So whenever I see, cause I've been using tallow, fortunately I found van man a couple of years ago and I've been using tallow since then. I love that dude. Uh, I know with skincare products that you find in stores have water in their ingredients. What does that do with the chemical composition when you put that on your skin? Yeah, great, great question. Okay, so my my early formulas, right? I, I told you I had the watershed moment. I started, okay, so yeah. I go to Google and it's like DIY skin cream, right? And it's I, the first recipe, I'll never forget, the first recipe I saw was like distilled water. It was, you know, I went to sort of one of the crunchy sites, you know, all natural crunchy sites. And it was distilled water, beeswax, and coconut oil, right? And so I just substituted one for one, lard for coconut oil. And I made this amazing cream. So luscious, it would just, I mean, it would just, it just beckons back, harkens back to a time of super luscious creams, right? Until about seven days after I made it and it would turn black and go rancid and smell like death. So <laughs> water, the emulsification of water and fat, okay? There's nothing uh, inherently wrong with that process, but what you're doing, um, everyone's cooked bacon. Most, hopefully your listeners have cooked bacon before. Right. And when you get done, you pour the drippings out into a jar or a coffee cup and they ju it just sits on your kitchen counter for a month or a couple of weeks until you spoon some out to, you know, to brown your, you know, chuck roast or whatever. Right. There's no water in there. It's water that feeds bacteria. OK. And mold and spores. I mean, again, this is sort of like bacteria mold 101. Right. Show me a wet, damp place and I'll show you some mold. And so this was the light bulb that, you know, hit me because I was making these luscious creams, but they were, they were rancid in, in, in a matter of days. And so, you know, the light bulb finally went off there. I was like, I, you know, I, I got two choices here. I can either take the water out or I can go back to school, study how to be a chemist and figure out what toxic crap I need to put into my cream. But I also need to understand how those that toxic crap might hurt, you know, the ultimate user of the cream. And I was like, I'm just going to take the water out. And so this is when we went from lard to lard and tallow. Um, you know, again, lo love what Van Man's doing. I love tallow. We use tallow in, in our products. We say the lard works in mysterious ways. And, and I, I believe that. I believe that lard, Ryan, I, here's what I say. The swine is divine, but the lard is hard. Okay, you with with pigs. Okay, you have to raise a healthy, happy, one bad day, well fed. I don't want to get into this whole poofa argument for a minute. Just let's just let's just talk about a, a plenty of sunshine, fresh air, fresh water, uh, fresh land pig. Okay, you have to do that with a pig. They are a monogastric omnivore, a four legged human. Okay, pigs are four legged humans. Um, a, a, a cow, which, you know, the, the tallow market is dominated by beef tallow. Okay. It's, but tallow is a placeholder term sort of for the rendered, uh, kidney fat from a ruminant animal. 
Okay, so you can have beef tallow, elk tallow, goat tallow, sheep tallow, right? It, but 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 importantly, it is the rendered visceral fat. That fat comes from inter inside the organs, okay, where it is protected, kind of like the 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 womb protects the child. The <laughs> our organs are encased, okay, and that visceral fat. You know, even in a poor environment, that visceral fat is protected from the metabolization and storage of either minerals and good stuff or toxicity via vaccines and antibiotics and, and just environmental exposure, right? So tallow, again, it's from a ruminant animal. We're, we're not a ruminant. We're an animal, but we're not a ruminant. Um, and it's also, tallow is also a, a cleaner fat coming from the industrial model, right? The swine is divine, the lard is hard. You brought it up. The the the, the industrial pig uh, scene in this country will absolutely turn your stomach. Uh, the, these animals, you know, uh, gestation from gestation to birth to market weight for a pig is just under a year. So gestation for a pig is three months, three weeks, and three days. That's a good one to remember for your listener. And then it's from birth, it's about eight months. Seven to eight months depends on where you want to finish them out. But you know, if a market size pig, uh, market size pig is going to finish out two seventy five to three hundred and twenty five pounds, something like that. That's all going to happen uh, from birth to about eight months. Okay, um, and 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 if it's raised in a house, if it's an industrial pig, that pig and its mother never saw the sun. Not one day saw the sun in its entire life. It, it, mama was born in a house, raised in a house. It was born in a house, moved to a different house. Uh, now, I say never saw the sun. They're, they might have a window or two in this huge industrial complex so they can check a box that says exposed to sunlight, which is horse shit, right? Um, you know, it's the same with like the the chicken, the pastured you know, what is it? Free range chicken. That's just yeah. such horse shit. Yeah. Yep. So there may be a window or two there, but, but effectively this animal that if, if you took a human and you removed that human from the sun for six months, you would find the sickest human you could possibly imagine. Like they, it would require all the drugs and all the extra attention and care because there's so much health that we as a species and pigs as a species get from our daily dose of the sun. And so, again, this is why the lard is hard. In an industrial model, I'll take tallow over lard all day. In fact, you you brought it up. Like I tell people, if you're going to go to the store, buy beef, buy lamb, buy sheep, buy, buy your ruminants at the store. You know, if you, if you want to have some pork, there's, there's a handful of brands, local regional brands, uh, well, Joyce Farms, you know, White Oak Pastures sells, you know, fairly robust size uh, uh, pork and beef. Uh, you can you can get it in stores. In other words, you can go to a grocery store and get some some high quality. But but by and large, you know, pork and chicken, like stay away, stay away from the 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 uh, the, the store bought model. It's it's I, I I would argue that store bought pork and store bought chicken. And regenerative pork and chicken are two completely different things, like completely different. So, yeah. um, so you know, from an industrial model, yes, I'm I'm a I'm a big tallow guy. Go go tallow. But once you drop down into pasture raised, regeneratively raised, you know, one bad day, I, I typically say uh, pork. Th that lard, uh, due to, due to the biological mimicry between humans. And pigs. Again, we, we train our surgeons on pigs. If you don't know that, we we use pig parts to fix human hearts. Do you know that? No. Oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. So go go talk to any heart surgeon worth their salt, and they'll tell you about two weeks ago when they took this heart valve out of a pig to repair the heart valve in a human. So the biology is, you know, we 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 will harvest hormones out of pigs and use them in humans. Like the biology is tight. And so if you raise a healthy, happy, we call it smart lard. I have trademarked smart lard. We're the first lard based skincare company out there. 
And so, sim- you know, just like there's an organic label for food or there's a, you know, paleo approved label or a whole 30 label. Well, by God, there's a smart lard label. And if you're going to, if you're going to come play in my sandbox, baby, you, you know, you better bring, you better bring high quality lard. Cause I don't want to talk if you're, if you're bringing this industrial goop, cause it's not good. Now, yeah. is it, is it better than Crisco? Maybe, maybe, um, you know, not a big fan of seed oils either, but I, I think you've got a real, I think you've got a real conundrum when you start talking about, again, due to the, due to the omnivorous, uh, monogastric nature of a pig and coupled with the environment that that pig grows up in. I mean, it's, it's horrific. It sounds like you've seen it. Have so you seen I it was, first? not firsthand, but I would, so I was vegan for two and a half years and it was all because of industrial, but one of the biggest reasons were actually pigs and chickens. And it's just so horrific for pigs. They are so stressed that they'll bite their tails off. There's all kinds of just terrible. Hor- yeah. Um, but I mean, you bring up so many good points. And then the second thing I wanted to, to mention too, in terms of, you've mentioned this in a previous podcast that I, I, uh, try to harp on as much as possible. There's so many levels to how we go about our food. So obviously the top, you want to have the pasture raised, regenerative raised pork. I really am disgusted by Smithfield foods, but I will argue that's obviously way better than pop tarts and cereal that you've mentioned in the previous podcast. So there's so many levels to that. And that's what the listeners should understand that eating that pork and, and the chicken from grocery stores is still better than all the ultra processed junk that is majority of our stores. Amen. Um, yeah. It's, it's, so, there's, there's bad, there's, there's, there's abhorrent, there's bad, there's good, better, and best. Yep. And, and this is the problem, you know, I, I think I alluded to the PUFA. I think I said something about the PUFA argument earlier. You know, there's a lot of pearl clutching and mashing of teeth around a brown pigs and improperly or not, not ideally fed and blah, 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 because they're polyunsaturated fatty acid content may be higher or lower than this, that, and the other. And I'm like, you know what? That all may be true, but damn it, people, I would rather people eat a, a pork chop bought from the store than a box of Cheerios or, you know, like we, 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 let's, let's not narrow the gate. Let's bro- let's broaden the gate just, just a little bit more. Um, so yeah, abhorrent, bad, good, better, best. And I, I, I would say that, uh, I would say that store-bought pork and chicken is good. It's not bad and it's not abhorrent. It's good relative to what's down below that in, in terms of the uh, supermarket. And that's just wild having to say that. And that's just when you just understand just how messed up the food system has gotten to this point to where we're saying that Smithfield foods is good because <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Well, yeah. The more and, and you know, you look Ryan, into it, Ryan, I'd, I'd love to come back on and talk to you because I, so I, I had an interesting situation earlier this year. I, I, you know, I sell a, an animal fat based skincare product and I was at a conference in Bastrop, Texas, and I had a woman walk up to me and she pleasant woman. And she says, I'm a vegan, but I'm very curious about your product. And so I think we talked for probably, this is probably like five minutes. It felt like an eternity. And, and we talked about it. And I, I, have, I have never done the vegetarian, vegan. I, I just, that was, I, I, I probably would have, you know, like, you know, I've tried a lot of diets. I just, it just, I, I'm going to say I got lucky. And the, the, the camps I was in never steered me that direction. You know, I met Rob Wolf early on and, and uh, anyway, you know, but um, I, I've so I've never been there. But the thing that's always really frustrated me, there's a couple things that have frustrated me. One is that I believe that people that farm the way I do and people that uh, believe it's important to raise these animals in the in the way that we're talking about. I believe that they have a lot in common with vegans, because if it's about animal husbandry and animals living a good life like Nature does not afford animals a good life. It does not. Um, you know, d- d- life is precious because of death. And um, I had this great conversation with this woman, and we we were able to talk, not past one another. She asked these great questions, and she bought my product, and she hmm. loved it. And wow. so, you know, I've always felt like 
here's the thing. I think that the, the popular, the popularity of veganism is more a testament to just how many people are completely and utterly removed from any aspect of the food production system. Like so far removed. I mean, I, if I talk to someone that's, that's a vegan, I, you know, I ask them, have you ever combined a field? Have you ever, you know, bush hogged a field? Like, ha, have you ever been on a farm? And, and by and large, the answer is no. And it's like, do you know how many animals die <laughs> growing soybeans? It's, it's, and, and listen, if you want your soybeans, go eat them. I, you know, it's, it's probably the one thing that drives me most bonkers about that ideology is they want everybody to do that mm -hmm. um, from this moral high ground. And again, I, I'd love to like unpack that more because I, I have felt for a long time that a vast majority of those people that are doing it for animal welfare, right? It's a, it's a better life for animals. I, I believe that they have a tremendous amount in common with people farming the way that Joel Salatin does or uh, uh, Will Harris or Primal Pastures or any, you know, any of these regenerative models. But you have to understand, you, 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 you just have to understand how, how all food is grown to, to, to be able to have a, an educated conversation about all that. Because I, 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 I'm with you, man. Smithfield, be damned. Um, we're, we're a long ways away from that. But, uh, but, but, but hopefully you, you know, your movement continues to grow. I'm, I'm in full support of it, but yeah, I, I'm that whole vegan thing, man. I mean, you're spot on because that's why I went vegan in the first place. I mean, like I mentioned, uh, before we, we started this, I didn't hear about regenerative agriculture until last year and hearing a lot of vegans, but not just vegans. Also, if you want to talk just like the, the climate, the pinning animal agriculture on climate change and most of them have never visited a farm or ranch either uh the intentions are there it's just uh, they have not they're just so disconnected like you're saying i mean that's a lot of these things have led me to the renaissance because i went down that path myself and there is an answer because we need i wholeheartedly believe we need animal protein when it comes down to it and then also just talking to you about these skin cares um because Cows and pigs, it's not just food. There's so much that we use for it from a holistic approach. They are incredible. I don't know where I'm going with that, but that's just, I completely agree with that notion. Um, spot on. My, well, yeah, oh, I'm, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, fin finish your th statement there. That was beautiful. <clears throat> that's, I guess it's just why I love regenerative agriculture. And since switching into it and talking to the farmers and ranchers, they're not evil people at all. <laughs> they're some of the most compassionate people, hardworking uh, very quick thinking on their feet. I mean, they wear so many hats and without food, we, we die and we don't advance as a civilization. And so it's just well, huge and, educational awareness problem. And that's why I, I love doing this. Yep. And, well, and I would, I would say farmers at large, right. And, and, you know, I know plenty of look, walk out my front door and head any direction. There's plenty of industrial farming going on around here. You know, we, again, back to my sort of uh, our farm, you know, my family's farm is industrially farmed. You know, I haven't I haven't been able to bridge that gap. I mean, I, I was doing my little regenerative thing in the nooks and crannies over there. But, you know, it's 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 not a regenerative model over there. And, uh, you know, I don't our, our federal government is to blame for a lot of that. Uh, in, in cahoots with, you know, it, it, I, when I say the federal government, you know, the USDA, you know, big ag, uh, big pharma, you know, um, they're all, they're all in cahoots, uh, with this stuff. And they've sold, if you understand how the industrial chicken, I'm, I'm assuming the industrial pig market works similarly, but the industrial chicken, like you see these chicken houses, right? The farmer doesn't own the house or no, the farmer owns the house. The farmer doesn't own the birds, doesn't own the feed, doesn't own anything. It just owns the house. Right. And so they talk, they show the, you know, they pull out the, the, uh, pencil and they show them, okay, you know, if you'll, if you'll agree to build this million dollar facility, we're going to run eight batches of chickens through this thing every year. And you're going to bring home, you know, whatever, whatever the number is a million, you're going to bring home a million dollars a year, whatever the number is. Right. 
well, okay, so that happens for a year, and then they then they got to go build more updates to keep up with the federal inspection and keep the birds happy. And so anyway, the same thing happens with grain mills. These farmers get um, way out over their skis debt wise to build these massive facilities to you know to um, to meet the requirements of these massive companies and and they don't they they don't control anything other they don't have anything other than the debt and so and so they become you know it's 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 indentured servitude you see the same thing with the grain mills i'm assuming you see the same thing with the industrial pork and and it's it's really it's sad you see the same thing with industrial grain you know around here i just i was just at west Bay price uh conference they had it up in uh, kansas city and I stopped in at, uh, you know, U.S. Wellness Meats, John mm-hmm. Wood and that crew. Yeah, John's awesome. Um, yeah, we need to, you need to get him on your podcast. He, he's, he's an OG in this movement. He, he'd be great for you to interview. But I went to see him up in Canton, Missouri. I hadn't driven through northern Missouri ever, you know. And, dude, it's just it's just nothing but grain mills. The entire north half of Missouri is nothing but roundup and grain mills and um and you know i'm driving around going man we could there is no question we could we could feed this country regeneratively with grass finished beef like the land's there you just got to have the right people to and let and get the government out of the way and man you'd make the most nutrient dense um i i can't give up on pasture pork either but i I, my view of, of proper dietary balance is uh, pork is like the dessert meat of a healthy, balanced diet. You know, it's it's a couple times a week. You know, maybe bacon in the mornings, and you know, but but you're in the uh, lexicon of of uh, protein acquisition. Uh, I would put beef and eggs, ruminants and eggs at the top, mm-hmm. uh, cheese up there somewhere close, and pork's never at the bottom of the list, but. Um, you know, pork requires more inputs, you know, it's an omnivore. I've got to feed, I've got to feed that pig, right? I've got to feed that chicken. On the topic of feeding the pork or the the pig, what is the optimal diet? Because you could look for the listeners. If you just look into industrial pigs and see what they're fed, it is horrific what they're fed. So I'm curious because you mentioned they need sunshine and, and good water yeah, well, so we we fed a uh, a fresh milled uh, mash out of Virginia. It's the same mill, Sunrise Farms that that Salton uses, and so it was. Uh, we used a uh, we used a soy free. There's various options, but it was a non GMO. Uh, you know, you've got organic feed, you've got GMO, you've got non GMO, and I, you know, I draw the quality line, if you will, at non GMO. So what does that say about the grain if it's non GMO? That means that whoever grew it uh, knows knows how to grow grains that don't need to rely on glyphosate or any of these other you know chemicals to kill off everything else that surrounds it. So you've got you know proper cover cropping and the off seasons and various things that these guys know what they're doing, right? And so you haven't genetically modified that grain. Um, in order to accommodate some chemical. So for me, that's a, that's a, the, the line of quality that I'm willing to draw. And I think most candidly, most consumers uh, could draw that line as well. Uh, Beyond that, I don't know what all they feed in the industrial model. You know, it's, it's probably, I've heard microplastics, you know, you bring all the waste products in from the candy factories and the this and the that, The, the, the beauty of a pig, Again, back to the similarities between pigs and humans. It's like, what's the optimal human diet? It's like, well, optimal, you know, thank God we're omnivores, right? Because we can survive and thrive on lots of various, just look around the world today, you know, go to your, go to Vegas. And then when you're done going to Vegas, go to Disney. And then when you're done going to Disney, go to Walmart, right? We can survive on lots of different dietary paths. Um but I would say with a pig and, and similar to a human, the optimal diet starts with fresh sunshine, fresh air, fresh water, and being outdoors, uh, getting outside and, and, and exposure to the sun. Uh, that's, the, that's the starter. 
in terms of what you feed them, uh, yeah, you want it's a grain based diet. You want to have plenty of pasture. You know, they're going to root. They're going to go around and and I mean, hell, a pig probably eats ten pounds of dirt a year just in rooting and getting you know getting it in. I mean, I've watched I've watched a pig pick up an acorn. This will blow your mind. I've watched a pig. You know, acorns fall in the fall, and I've watched a pig, uh, one of my sows, pick up an acorn and toss it around in her mouth cracking the acorn and spitting the husk out and eating the nut <laughs> with her teeth. I have watched her do that. It is the most, I mean, you know, these are, these are, these are highly effective animals. And so, um, you know, they, and they're incredibly smart. Like again, pigs, pigs and humans share quite a bit. I, I would make the argument that we're, they're arguably one of our closest genetic relatives on the planet, um, you know, just due to by default of what we do, how, how we utilize them in the medical field. And so, yeah, you take that, you take that pig out and you give them plenty of sunshine and some good food and, and, uh, some belly scratches from time to time. And that, that, that fat is going to, uh, it's going to nourish your skin like nothing you could ever have imagined. What's different about, um, I guess, in terms of the actual benefits, whether it be the vitamins and mineral content of lard, that's so mm -hmm. beneficial for us. Well, I, I've read it in a couple places. You know, you're you're going to be hard pressed to find a double blind placebo test of anything animal fat, right? Because who's going to pay for yeah. that study? But but I have read a number of a uh, number of blogs, a number of articles that um, lard is the most similar uh, exogenous compound on the planet to human sebum. Okay, so sebum for your listeners that don't know is the, is the oil that our glands produce. So if you're getting a little greasy or oily, you know that's that's your your you've produced that. Um, and so and, and then we, you know with with optimal skincare, you're talking about a couple of different things. You're talking about biology, right? So how does it match up biologically? We're not a coconut. We're not a shea. We're not a palm. You're, we're certainly not a, a petrolatum. You know, we're not a petroleum derivative either. We're we're an we're a monogastric omnivore. To to be to to get it as specific as as I need to, we're a monogastric omnivore. We're not even a ruminant. Again, love tallow, love you tallow using my products, but we are not a ruminant. We are a monogastric omnivore. Okay, and so uh, when you start talking about your skin eats things, it's our second stomach. It consumes things. Uh, if you've never uh, brushed up against poison ivy, right? You, you know exactly what I'm talking about because the poison ivy has oil on it. And if you walk up on a poison ivy and you spend too much time in there, you're going to see what happens when your skin eats that oil. And so our skin consumes things. And ideally, it's going to consume things that it recognizes. Okay. And it's going to recognize lard above and, uh, above and beyond any other fat that we put on our skin because the pH is a spot on balance, the uh, balance uh, between monounsaturated, saturated, and polyunsaturated, you know, the lipid balance is a spot on match. How pigs metabolize vitamins A, E, D, C, like all the vitamins and minerals in skincare that are, that, you know, I call it the big trifecta. It's A, E, and D, I call the trifecta. Now you could argue C is just as important, but how a pig metabolizes and stores those vitamins is the exact same mechanism as a human. They store vitamin D through sun exposure and they store it in their subcutaneous fat, right? They store vitamin E, you know, from diet and, and, and exercise and sun and all the, you know, but mechanistically they are metabolizing and storing all of those vitamins and minerals the same way humans do. So it's, it's, you know, it's it's the lock and key, man. It's it's yeah. square peg, square hole. I mean, it's 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 a spot on match. That's awesome. So, with that being said, I will have to call it for there. Where should um, all the listeners find you at? So, so our our website's the the best place, Faro dot life. Uh, it's it's f a r r o w dot life. And uh, you know, if if anyone's interested in, in um, in our products, if you use the coupon code, I mean, we've got an email list, and and I would certainly encourage folks to sign up for that. We, we're a year and a half into this journey, and and uh, having a ball, 
and want want to bring you along for the ride. But uh, First Order, F-I-R-S-T, First Order, all one word will save you 15% off of your first order if you want to try even our products. But um, Ryan, this is, listen, man, I am, I am, we were talking before we got on and I know we're up against it. I'd love to come back on and, and chew the fat with you about uh, about more about you. Uh, I, I learned a lot from your your interview with Brett and Harry. It was an amazing interview. Uh, much love and appreciation for everything you're doing and, and, and much success for you, sir. Well, thank you, Charles. Have a good one, y'all.